All right, welcome everyone to the North Saskatchewan Watershed Alliance's Watershed Wednesday webinar. My name is Michelle Gordy and I'm Watershed Planning Coordinator at the NSWA and uh, will be your host this afternoon. So the NSWA has been hosting webinars the first Wednesday of the month for the last three months, highlighting various watershed issues and topics in the North Saskatchewan River watershed. I'm joined today by several NSWA staff, including Leah Kongsrud, Elisa Brose, Mary Ellen Shane, Kelsey Norton, and Rosie Redmanovich. And we're also joined today by um, some NSWA board members. Um, uh, I think Steve Craig I saw on there. I'm not sure who else is, is joining in uh, with us, um, but uh, they're kind of helping out in the background and. Um, so I appreciate their, their willingness to be here. So the theme for today's webinar is invasive species. And we will have two guest speakers, Nicole Kimmel and Bernie Poulin, who will be sharing knowledge, experience, and expertise about invasive species within the watershed. Before we begin, we would like to acknowledge the traditional lands and territories that this watershed is a part of and the many Indigenous peoples and nations of this place. We recognize that the North Saskatchewan River uh, watershed is part of the traditional lands and territories of many Indigenous peoples. The North Saskatchewan River watershed overlaps with Treaties 6 and 8, which are home to 17 First Nations and Métis regions 1, 2, 3, and 4. Recognizing that we are all treaty people, we seek to fulfill the spirit and intent of these treaties through an ongoing process. And we're committed to building stronger relationships that respect the indigenous peoples of this place and strive to work together to care for the land, water, and all living beings who call this watershed home. So the format of our webinar today will include two different presentations from guest speakers. There will be time for questions at the end of each presentation. So we ask that you please use the chat feature to type your questions. We ask that you please keep your video off and keep your microphone muted so that we have more bandwidth available for smoother presentations. We will also be using the poll feature to ask a few questions during this webinar. So let's get things started with the first poll question, Elisa. So the question is, what sector are you from? And we'll give a little bit of time for people to enter their selection. So I'm seeing several from provincial and municipal government, a lot from NGOs, which is wonderful, a little from industry, informed citizens, and the mystery title of other. All right, do you wanna go ahead and share the results? So mostly NGO um, and government and a little bit of industry academia, wonderful. All right, so let's just move on. Um, so at the end of the session today, we will be drawing the name of one of our attendees for an NSWA gift basket. Um, and it's going to include a copy of our Living in the Shed book, as well as some of our brand new swag, uh, like a reusable bag and mouse pad. So stay tuned to the end to find out if you're a winner. So this webinar today marks the end of our Spring Watershed Wednesday series. In February, we talked about climate change. And in March, we gave an overview of watershed management in Alberta. All of our Watershed Wednesday webinars are recorded and the links to our YouTube channel um, are posted on the NSWA website. So you can subscribe to our YouTube channel and keep up to date with uh, the various videos that we post on there, um, as well as the recording of uh, this session. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and introduce our first presenter. Um, so our first presentation today is about aquatic invasive species threats to the North Saskatchewan River, and this is presented by Nicole Kimmel. Nicole is an aquatic invasive species specialist for Alberta Environment and Parks. She supports the aquatic invasive species program elements for Alberta and largely focuses on education and the response to species that have broken through prevention efforts. So I'm gonna go ahead and hand it over to you, Nicole. Perfect, okay, I'll just get my screen shared. 
There we good. Looks yep. great. Okay. So thanks for having me uh, on your lunch hour. I'm happy to be here presenting to you today. And I might look all intimidating in my officer like uniform, but I'm just a biologist. So I just wanted to make that clarification because some of the, the folks were intimidated. So um, just a biologist working on aquatic invasive species. Um, I just wanted to touch on the top threat is still the invasive mussels. This is where we put a, a huge amount of efforts. Um, you can tell by our program being largely funding our watercraft inspections, um, trying to prevent these species from being introduced at our borders, both the east and the south border are, are where our stations are concentrated because these ones will affect all water users despite um, you know knowing it or not. So water infrastructure, the drinking, the, the water treatment plants, the recreation, it, it, it affects everyone. So it's still the top priority. And I just wanted to share the map of where the locations are. Uh, this is still almost a year out of date. There's new locations that need to be added to this, but they haven't updated it yet. Uh, the closest zebra mussel locations are Manitoba. And uh, the concerning one on the quagga mussels is the snowbirds down by Arizona uh, coming back with boats from the quagga mussel infestations there. So. Every year there's more and more dots, unfortunately, and Mo um, Montana had a few detections, but they're actually about to drop off. And so we pretty have a pretty good defense system in the Pacific Northwest. So those three provinces and five states just below us. So we're working really hard together collaboratively to try and keep that muscle free status as, as long as possible. It's not all, only um, the only species that I work on addressing. I get a lot of weird and wacky things thrown at me throughout uh, the year. So we've responded to tilapia, which is an aquatic uh, aquaculture species that somebody tried to introduce into Elbow River down by Calgary. Um, so that was a weird and wacky occurrence that we hadn't anticipated. We got called from the Calgary International Airport to whether they detected a box full of Chinese mitten crab. And so um, we didn't have specific legislation on these species, but uh, the introduction of these live species is alarming and it's hard to stay on top of all the commerce that's being traded across the world. We get uh, snails, um, terrestrial and aquatic. These are terrestrial snails that are invasive in BC, but probably wouldn't overwinter in Alberta. So we don't have them listed, uh, but we do get some detections in some stock nursery stocks being moved around in Alberta. So it does happen for introductions. This is an African or giant African land snail, which somebody brought back as a shell from Hawaii, thinking it was a beautiful shell. And then it proceeded to crawl across their coffee table when they had it on display. Um, this one is a prohibited species and um, it will eat stucco and houses down in Hawaii. It wouldn't overwinter here, so we're not that concerned about it overwintering, but it, it was introduced. So that's how easily it happens. The American bullfrog, I'm sure folks are somewhat familiar with the invasive properties of this fish. And so we did get a uh, report from the University of Alberta where they brought in some tadpoles for some research and they detected this off type and it turned out to be an American bullfrog. And we recently just shut down somebody trying to offer American bullfrogs um, to teachers as a, as a learning tool in their classrooms. So um, things are coming at us from, from all different avenues for introduction. And then last but not least is the octopus that was apparently pulled out of Lake McGregor. And we got reported this occurrence uh, via Facebook, but we were never able to confirm based on the follow-ups we tried. But the picnic table does seem to fit and the snow in the background makes it somewhat believable. But So weird and wacky species are coming to Alberta for introduction, possible introduction um, throughout the year. So I just wanted to highlight some impacts on why we spend so much time and attention on trying to prevent or respond to aquatic invasive species. Um, so this is a picture of uh, flower and rush. This is my nemesis plant species and Bernie will speak more to this one, but 
Uh, we have a picture here of Lake Isle where the flower and rush is easily outcompeting all the native plants, whether it be cattails or bulrushes. So um, flower and rush is doing this very well, but other species have this capacity as well. They can easily disrupt aquatic ecosystems. And so some of that imbalance um, helps feed blue-green algae blooms. Um, the flow of water could be impeded in trapping these fish, um, which happen to be Prussian carp on this picture, but uh, nonetheless, we're worried about them trapping uh, fish in the alteration of water flow. And then the last picture on the right is flowering rush. The beaver is trying to keep that can uh, canal to the open water uh, free for his swimming and is struggling to do so um, because of the quick regrowth. Aquatic invasive species disrupt food chains. Um, many species are taking out some of the food chain, invasive mussels, for example, take out the lower of the food chain and then disrupt everything food webbed above it. And that can be quite devastating to the populations uh, of fish at the highest point in aquatic systems. Water infrastructure, we rely on um, an enormous amount of water infrastructure in Alberta for drinking as well as irrigation. We're talking billions and billions of dollars and invasive mussels are the biggest threat because of this ability to attach to pipes and structures and really impede the flow of water to where we need it to be. And then many of these species have reproductive advantages that um, outcompete our native species quite easily. So Purple loosestrife, for example, 2.5 million seeds in a really good growing season, which is ex exponentially high for a plant species, but it's impressive. Uh, the middle picture is Prussian carp, which can do thousands of eggs of reproduction, multiple spawning events a summer, which can really fuel their populations to thousands in just a matter of years. And then the pictures on the right are flower and rush, where they have multiple avenues for reproduction whether it be a broken fragment that's floating and will start growing roots as it floats, or the bottom picture is the bulbules, those little onion-like bulbs on the side of the roots. That's all that's required to break off and start a new population. And they will float to a new location if they're broken off, which makes these things really hard to address. And then last but not least, uh, they really impact, impede our recreational use, whether it's we're boating, angling, um, enjoying a beach, a walk, or a hike. Um, some of these species can be quite damaging. So the, the picture on the left is flower and rush starting to choke off that open water. And then the picture on the right is from Lake Winnipeg in Manitoba, where mussel shells have washed a shot across, uh, across the shoreline. And you can't actually wear bare or just have bare feet on anymore on this beach because you will cut your feet if you walk along it. Uh, those shells do get quite sharp. That's why we really spend a lot of time and attention on aquatic invasive species because of these high risk impacts that uh, affect many, many aspects of our aquatic ecosystem. So thankfully we have the Alberta Aquatic Invasive Species Program, which was started in 2013. And we really strengthened legislation in 2015. And we've been running ever since kind of full gusto. We have pillars of our program that really support um, all together to really operate the program. So we have policy and legislation pieces. We have education and outreach, monitoring those watercraft inspections. And then when all that fails, uh, we're responding to species that have broken through the prevention efforts. This just gives you a snapshot of um, what we were dealing with in 2020. So this map is a little dated. I need to add a, a few locations. Unfortunately, we're not taking off very many locations of aquatic invasive species across Alberta. Um, most of them are being added and by far, I think goldfish is probably the highest increasing species that we're, we're getting more and more locations. So um, the, the blue dots are Prussian carp in the Red Deer region, quite well established. And then flowering rush is well established in the South Saskatchewan that is headed into Saskatchewan now um, due to our lack of oppor opportunities to control it. So we've shared it with Saskatchewan as well as the Prussian carp we've now shared with uh, Saskatchewan due to connection, water connections. But for the most part, Edmonton in Northern Alberta is you know, fairly unscathed from large scale uh, infestations, but it doesn't mean that it can't happen. So 
we're working hard to keep things minimized for impacts as much as possible. So I really wanted to focus uh, today on some threats to the North Saskatchewan River watershed, just to give you a heads up on what you should be looking out for. So last year we had this huge detection of uh, zebra mussels being found in moss balls, which we had never anticipated would be a vector for the introduction of zebra mussels. And so we worked really hard in March of last year, contacting over 800 stores and confiscating over 2,500 moss balls, trying to minimize that risk of those being released. Cause we know what people do with their goldfish in aquariums. So it, all it would take is a villager, and so a mussel and larval form in the water to be dumped with a goldfish, and that could potentially start an, a population of mussels here. So um, this has really heightened our risk for mussels being detected in Alberta. So I really wanted to make sure that this was top of your mind and uh, ensure that you're aware that this might still be impacting Alberta, despite our efforts to minimize um, the release in March. So we heavily relied on the public to do the right thing in response to this species. Next up, the big one is Flower and Rush. Bernie will talk about um, his efforts at Lake Isle. Um, and we are moving ahead with another herbicide application for Lake Isle for 2022. And we are moving ahead with actually a five-year application so we're hoping to contract for five years as well as get the approvals for five years for doing a herbicide. And we will include the entire lake this year. So with that expansion, we have uh, a, a lot more work to do in preparation for that, but we're building on the success of last year's treatment, which uh, went off quite well. It was a little bit delayed, but still within our acceptable window of application. So we're looking forward to that. So that's Lake Isle, but we also have Flower and Rush in the Sturgeon River. Um, running through St. Albert quite prolifically and then downstream of there. So there's multiple um, points of introduction to the North Saskatchewan and as well as Edmonton had some locations as well. So and this is a pretty high risk species for the North uh, Saskatchewan. Next up is Himalayan balsam. Um, this is a widespread ornamental plant that was uh, allowed prior to 2010 and then the Weed Control Act listed it. We listed it in 2015 under the Fisheries Act, trying to prevent uh, this damaging plant from escaping those ornamental growing locations and then wreaking havoc in our riparian areas. And I, I do know that the shores along Lake Isle have a few occurrences, but um, this one is quite easy to address. If you stay on top of it, you can hand pull your way out of this plant, but you need to stay diligent for at least three years um, for those seeds that might germinate after you hand pull. So, and Edmonton had multiple locations and is dealing with some um, locations in, in the ravines as well. So multiple points. The urban centers are the highest risk points, um, but it could easily go through the drainage systems out to our natural waterways as well. Pale yellow iris, this is another ornamental um, and unfortunately, we did have a major infestation at the Wagner Natural Area, which is just out west of Edmonton. And um, we've been working hard on those locations to respond to it. We had a private uh, Parkland County property that was using barriers. And I believe the Wagner Natural Area was working on some barriers and pulling and digging as well. So we're, they're chipping away at their populations as much as possible. But um, and then City of Edmonton also had some locations from the ornamental side. It's escaping into some stormwater management ponds. And most of the stormwater management ponds in Edmonton are connected to the North Saskatchewan at some point. So um, this one should be on your radar as well. Purple loose strife. Um, this is like the, you know, the, the poster child for invasive plants, aquatic plants. Um, most folks know about this one. And so we did um, do a lot of work with Ducks Unlimited in the 90s to try and minimize the impacts of purple loose drive in Alberta. And we did a significant job of that, but we still have a few locations that are still causing us havoc. Um, this location is out by Wainwright, where they were basically collecting all the water from the Wainwright, the city of Wainwright. Um, and then because of flooding of residential lands and farmlands, they were actually 
invested in pumping the water from the slough area um, to the, the Battle River. And so that connection is, is alarming. So we're working hard to keep it just contained in this slough area before it goes downstream into the river and then it becomes a logistical nightmare trying to manage. So, um, and there are other locations like the city of Edmonton had a few in like Horlack Park, for example. So there are points of introduction for purple strike as well. And I do get some reports at Wallaman Lake as well. Um, we can dig our way out of this one, luckily. Invasive Phragmites, another plant, you can see plants seem to be dominating um, my response efforts, which is, I, I'm not too sure why, but um, they're a little bit easier to detect, I, I'm assuming, rather than, than fish and invertebrates. So this is Invasive Phragmites. It's um, largest vector of transport, it seems to be CN and CP railway lines, it likes to go along the wet right of ways. And so we're working hard to keep CN and CP on top of their known locations. So we have multiple locations coming in um, along Highway 14. And then we have a few extending up into the Peace region throughout um, the highways up that way as well. So uh, more and more locations are popping up on this. It is um, a bit challenging because there is an, a native type as well as an invasive type. Um, but we are supporting the DNA analysis. So all we need is green leaf samples to be sent to me. And then we can support uh, identifying if it's the invasive type or the native type. And we do have enough invasive types that it could be either or. So if in question, if in doubt, um, send, send me some samples, we can work with you to that identified correctly. And then yellow floating heart is another one that this one likes to grow um, as a floating plant. Um, we don't have very many of these that um, are introduced, but this is one of them. And so it was introduced ornamentally and allowed for sale up until 2015 when the Fisheries Act um, basically prohibited it. Um, but we did find it in the, the Edmonton Valley Zoo and they were pumping the water from where this pond was to the North Saskatchewan prior to the, the, prior to the detection of this plant. Um, so they've altered their management efforts afterwards and are working to eradicate this plant whenever it's being seen and they're doing a pretty good job. They've only had a few occurrences uh, since we detected it in 2019. So be on the lookout for this, this new floating uh, aquatic invasive species that might be in the North Saskatchewan. Um, so those are the species that are actually listed under the Fisheries Act um, as prohibited species. So they're a little bit heightened because we have some legislation authorities to go after them in response. Um, but we still have these other species that are not listed mostly due to their prevalence, um, but they still have fairly high impacts. And so we're looking to minimize those impacts. So. One of those species is goldfish. Um, we have almost a hundred locations across Alberta. So this is a pretty widespread problem all the way from Fort McMurray um, down to Southern Alberta, East West, there, there is no limitations. It's usually in high urban areas, but um, we do know that most of the stormwater management systems in these urban areas do feed into our natural systems. And we're starting to get reports of goldfish um, for example, in the North Saskatchewan. So we already have reports of goldfish being present in the North Saskatchewan, and we did um, catch them in a stormwater management pond and the outfall is where they were being reported. Every time we went out there to try and confirm that they were goldfish, um, we kept missing them, the detection. So we knew that they were probably spilling over. So then we looked up, up uh, higher and into the ponds and that's when we confirmed that they did indeed have goldfish in three of these ponds. Um, Epcor has stepped up um, just last year, treated for goldfish and removed uh, about, what was it, 13,000 goldfish from three stormwater management ponds. In just a few short years, this, this is a new subdivision. So it doesn't take very long for these guys to get in there and they do grow quite big. Uh, a close relative and um, as easily dumpable as a goldfish apparently is koi. So we've, we've responded to a few locations of koi as well. This one in St. Albert got a lot of media attention about a 11 year old kid catching um, this 16 pound koi with a hot dog, piece of hot dog. 
And so St. Albert did a treatment and we're pulling out bigger koi fish than what the kid caught. So we're talking 18, 19 pounds. And so we have a model of one of the koi and it's, it's, a, it's a showstopper when we take it out um, on the road for, for trade shows. So. Another uh, close relative of the goldfish and the koi is these rosy red minnows, which are actually our color morph of a fathead minnow that are available basically as feeder fish in the pet aquarium trade in industry. And so you can get these for like 30 cents a piece or something, um, which makes them pretty easy to obtain. And we've had some detections of people, people releasing this as well, not near to the locations that we have for goldfish, but we do have a few locations of no known releases of rosy red minnows as well. And some of those are in the North Saskatchewan uh, watershed. Whirling disease um, reared its ugly head in 2016, and we have now detected this in the North Saskatchewan uh, watershed as well. We're just, you know, barely into the, let me see if I can point it, just on the northern part here of our detections, that's where the North Saskatchewan comes into play. So we're just starting to enter that watershed. Um, and this is showing quite devastating impacts in the Crow's Nest Pass area to trout species there. So um, we have no really good response options other than trying to contain it as much as possible through cleaning practices. So that's why we promote the clean, drain, dry practices for the gear trying to mitigate whirling disease now that it's, it's um, in multiple watersheds. Northern crayfish, uh, we initially thought we were trying to protect them in the Wainwright Riley area, the beaver watershed. Um, now we know that they're pretty well widespread across central and southern Al Alberta. We believe folks are moving them though and are helping their expansion of range quite, quite a lot. So we have pretty hefty fines for anybody caught moving crayfish, um, but this isn't the only crayfish we're worried about. So there are a whole suite of invasive crayfish um, that could easily be mistaken for our northern crayfish um, that we're trying to stay on top of. So we're looking out for like the marbled, um, the rusty, the red swamp crayfish. Some of these are available by food um, imports. So. All of them have proven to be northern crayfish, but um, we're worried about this species. And we have now detected them up into the Grand Prairie region. So they're quite widespread, more than originally thought. So there's still more work to do. Those are the, the top species for you to kind of be familiar with and keep your eye out for. There is some poor behaviors that we are encouraging folks to really pay attention to and try to change their behavior. So, we're still seeing lack of or poor clean drain dry practices. So um, this boat trailer has a lot of plant material uh, hanging off of it. This is a high risk for moving flower and rush to a new water body. All it needs is a little chunk to be stuck to a trailer and you know, floated into a new water body. The picture on the, the right shows good practices of pulling that drain plug, but we do not want you to pull your drain plug right next to the drain, which allows that environment to still remain wet and introduce possibly contaminated water into a water source. Um, so there's still more work to do. We're pushing these messaging of the clean drain dry. It doesn't matter what species we're facing, whether it's a plant, an invertebrate, a snail, a mussel, um, a fish, those three behaviors of cleaning and draining and drying can stop a lot of species from being moved around. So that's really why we boil it down to simple messaging. We are still getting pretty poor compliance with failing to pull the plug and we're just be able to monitor this through our watercraft inspection stations of boats coming through. So um, we're at about a 20%, just under 20% non-compliance. Um, for the pull, lacking the pulling the plug. And this is just interprovincial transfers. So we suspect that there's probably a lot of inter or within the province transfers of water still happening. So we really need to focus on pulling the plug. It is mandatory. You could get a fine if somebody pulls you over and you have your plug in for transport. And that is a $180 fine. So we'll be pushing that messaging a little bit more this year than we have previously. 
live transfer still happens um, from time to time. And so we work heavily with our fish and wildlife officers because they have the authorities to do most of the seizing and managing the transfers. So um, the pictures on the left showcase folks that were caught with live crayfish being moved around. So they were actually charged uh, um, under those offenses, whether it stayed or not, I haven't followed up, up to see if it, it was, you know, continued all the way to the fine part of it, but it just shows you how easily um, people could be moving things around. The moss balls was a good example of that live transfer of, you know, pet aquarium species that we didn't even think was a threat for invasive mussels, actually bringing them here and, you know, distributing them across Canada and the US quite easily. And then our boats, our watercraft boats, this is a picture of what we're kind of detecting on our watercraft inspection stations. So they're, they're never heavily encrusted and quite obvious. Um, we're actually looking at the nooks and crannies along a bolt or a crack or crevice. That's where the mussels will be attaching and, and showing themselves. And then we struggle with this intentional release of the goldfish as well as other species. Um, the pictures on the left and the bottom are actually where I was collecting flowering rush samples down along a canal near Chestermere. And I came across these decorative rocks that usually belong in, in an aquarium. So we suspect it's quite accessible. That bridge um, there is just a quick park to the side and then you can walk right down to the water's edge and probably dump your aquarium quite easily. So um, we have seen firsthand evidence of it occurring. And um, unfortunately, the, the trouble is trying to catch somebody in the act. So just to wrap up, it's um, creative partnerships that tackle aquatic invasive species in Alberta. I'm one person trying to orchestrate many pieces on the response and the education outreach side. Uh, I don't do it alone. I leverage groups like yourself to spread the message, keep your eyes and ears open for things that don't look like they belong, and then follow up with a, a, a call to the hotline to see if it warrants any further investigation. So I'll leave it at that. Here's my email and my contact information, and I'll open it up to any questions that anyone might have. Wonderful, thank you so much, Nicole. Um, Marilyn, do we have any questions in the chat? Not so far, but I uh, I do have a question myself. So uh, Nicole, I was just wondering if there have been any uh, economic estimates of what the what the financial impacts actually have been um, of invasive species in Alberta. So the only one that we've been able to tackle um, quite extensively, I wish that there was more because money talks and that's a good leverage point. But we've been able to do an assessment of if invasive mussels were to be established fairly widespread across Alberta, what would that cost Alberta as a whole? And the number came back at $75 million a year. A year. In, in maintenance or control efforts to try and mitigate the impacts. And this is probably on par because Ontario, who has invasive mussels, is spending $75 million a year mm. in mitigation. So, and that's just one species. Well, two, technically, uh, yeah, two is two. calculated between the quagga and the zebra. Mm -hmm. But yeah. Amazing. Wow. Um, we do have another question here. If we suspect an invasive species some, uh, has been introduced somewhere, uh, who should we contact and what, what are those steps? So, the, the best one point com, uh, contact is our hotline, the Aquatic Invasive Species Hotline, which is 818-55-336. Um, and they basically, <clears throat> you'll get um, put through to our report a poacher call center. So we use the same operators. They will take down your name, number, and, and a quick synopsis of what your, your issue is. And then they create an email that gets sent out to either me or Cindy Sawchuk, who oversees the watercraft inspection stations. And then we work to follow up with those locations. So we might call you back and get more information and pictures or whatever you have to share on the report. So that's how that's the easiest way is using the hotline. But you could just use the information on the screen as well. It works as well. Um, 
And uh, we do have one more question here. If uh, you know, are goldfish more adapted to stagnant water overflowing um, rivers or, and creeks? So in general, they're very adaptable. They, there is no limitations, whether it's, you know, they can survive pretty cold or warm temperatures. Um, they don't mind the flows of some areas they feed and stir up a whole bunch of sediment. So even murky waters doesn't um, seem to, you know, affect them in any way. So they're highly adaptable and we do not want them in our natural waterways because they will outcompete because they can eat whatever they want, can fit in their mouth, basically highly adaptable in what they eat, um, multiple spawning events every summer, thousands of eggs at a time. And they're actually able, capable of cloning themselves if they really wanted to. So you only need one to be introduced. And then it can use the sperm of other cyprinid family species, so other minnow family, um, wow. and, and actually reproduce. So Amazing. Yeah. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Nicole. We really appreciate having you here today. And um, I'm going to go ahead and present our next speaker. Okay, so our, uh, but before we get started with that, uh, Elisa, do you want to share the next poll question? All right, so the question is encounters with invasive species. Which of these invasive species have you come across? We've got flowering rush, purple loosestrife, baragmites, pale yellow iris, Himalayan balsam, goldfish, Prussian carp, wild boar. Nice to see that there's lots of people who haven't encountered yeah. <laughs> any of them. Definitely. All right. It looks like we were about even on Flowering Rush and Purple Loose Strife and quite a bit for a Himalayan balsam. All right. Very interesting. Okay. So our uh, next speaker for today is Bernie Poulin. He's a retired St. Albert School principal with a career of 37 years. He retired 16 years ago and moved out to the summer village of Silver Sands and was elected to the Council of Silver Sands 12 years ago. Currently, he is the chair of the Lilsa Water Quality Group for Lake Isle and Lac St. Anne, and also the chair of the Association of Summer Villages of Lac St. Anne Counties East. He chairs Sigis Child Care in the city of St. Albert and is director of the Seniors Foundation for Lac St. Anne County and the ongoing past president for the Alberta Teachers Association of St. Albert Public Schools. So he's staying quite busy after retirement. He's also married with two children and has four grandkids. And today he's going to be talking to us about um, his experience with Flowering Rush at Isle Lake. So go ahead and take it away, Bernie. Um, let's see, yeah, Kelsey's got the presentation going. Good. All right, there we Thank go. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, and thank you to Kelsey for getting some PowerPoint. Uh, being an older retired guy, I am uh, I do use cell phones and those other items, but uh, not really up to date on some of the software. Uh, anyway, in 2013, the summer villages of Lake Isle and Lac St. Anne asked to rejuvenate the Lake Quality Society, which existed in the 1990s. So that's when LILSA was renewed to deal with water quality and other lake issues. Flowering Rush became our top issue in 2016. Well, over three years, LILSA applied and received grants to educate lake residents uh, as well as to purchase some equipment to manually re remove flowering rush. Nicole Kimmel helped us train uh, the executive members on identification and safe removal. We held uh, several community-based events to remove rush from a variety of areas around Lake Isle. 
In uh, 2018, Lisa Cahoon of Pintail Environment was hired to explore best practices in dealing with flowering rush. And the methods uh, that she uh, examined included multiple cuttings, benthic barriers, digging, and the possibility of steaming and burning. In 2018-19, the county of Lac St. Anne, Alexis First Nations, the summer villages of West Cove, Southview, and Silver Sands, along with Lilsa, applied for an Alberta Community Partnership Grant, ACP, and we received $198,000. Uh, and this is a collaborative three-year grant. So spanning from 2019 to 2021. In the first year of our grant, we hired uh, Lisa Cahoon to be our consultant to train our teams of uh, two teams of six people, uh, three people each with a total of six. We had five meetings with Alexis explaining to the indigenous elders a serious problem that we had with flowering rush. During that time, we're also invited to a cultural sensitivity training session given by Alexis elders that helped us understand their cultural beliefs. It was uh, quite impressive. Um, so our teams did mapping of Lake Isle, Lac St. Anne and the connecting Sturgeon River. We received a three year permit from Alberta Environment for the multiple cuttings uh, and removal plus benthic barriers. We actually removed 3,200 pounds of flowering rush with the two work crews over the 10 weeks. We did multiple cuttings in two areas, Gainford and Kokomoko, and this helped reduce the strength of the uh, flowering rush. All during this time, we also geotagged all of the rush clumps that the teams encountered. And we forwarded this to Nicole at the, year, at the end of the year to produce uh, up-to-date maps. In 2020, COVID interfered with the collaborative work with Alexis. We had only one meeting in June with no consensus on the chemical treatment of the invasive species. The three person crew worked from June 1 to September 4th. Uh, don't know if you remember, but uh, was a high water table event that whole year. And the ice and high water released many floating islands of, flo uh, of flowering rush. And we engaged a uh, a local uh, farmer who has a cutting machine that kind of like a swather can pick up. And he picked up 51 truckloads in the area west of the Lutheran camp, which is at the west end of uh, Lake Isle. So what had happened was the high water caused the, boy the flotation of these, they're quite buoyant. And also the ice, uh, because everything was so high, it cut up these floating uh, units. So we're fortunate to be able to uh, gather them before they floated down uh, downstream to the Sturgeon River. Many floating clumps in the Jones Beach area were removed manually, remapped Lake Isle, Sturgeon River, and the West Basin of Black St. Anne. To date, we have no recorded sightings in Lac St. Anne. Removed two clumps of flowering rush in the Sturgeon River, which connects Lake Isle and uh, uh, Lac St. Anne. We continued with multiple cuttings at Gainford and Kokomoko. Geotagged those rush clumps again for year 20, uh, 2020 and forward that to Nicole to update the current map. In 2021, COVID was still prevented our Indigenous collaboration. The three-person team continued their work of mapping Lake Isle, the Sturgeon River, 
and the West Basin of Lac St. Anne. To date, no flowering rush has been found in the West Basin of Lac St. Anne. The team re uh, removed approximately 750 pounds of flowering rush. They picked a large amount of floating rhizomes in the various bays on Lake Isle. At the end of August, 15 kilometers was sprayed with a mazapir at the west, western portion of Lake Isle. We continue to geotag the rush clumps and again forward that to Nicole. This year, we uh, received approval for a grant extension for year four of this project. Uh, we had uh, $67,000 remaining in the grant. This will permit us a continuation of uh, hiring our three person team. The first priority will be to assess the success of a Mazapir spraying at the west end of Lake Kyle. So the growing season starts after the long, May long weekend into the first uh, couple of weeks of June. So we hope to see some results there. We will continue to map Lake Isle, Sturgeon River in the West Basin of Lac St. Anne, provide education to lake residents on safe removal of flowering rush. Early in that the lake levels will be lower this year as a snowpack has resulted in very little runoff. Higher lake levels could result if we have a wet spring as it was two years ago. Obviously the lower the lake level, the easier it is to deal with flowering rush. So our team works out of the maintenance building at the Summer Village of Silver Sands. We annually lease a half ton truck. We lease a sea can to store and dispose of flowering rush. Uh, we also lease a sea can from the Summer Village to store all of the equipment, which includes three kayaks and all their safety equipment hip waders, plastic calving sleeves, and uh, of course our garment that uh, is kept in that area. Uh, and just to wrap up, uh, over the course of the three years that I've, well, the six years that I've been working with Nicole on this issue at Lake Isle, I've had many meetings with local MLAs to lobby uh, to make sure they understand uh, the importance of this invasive species. And I've had multiple meetings with Minister Nixon to encourage them to dedicate some money to eradicate the flowering rush in the Lake Isle area. So that basically, uh, I think, outlines what we've been trying to do. Uh, so originally, we just had a small crew, the seven directors were working with local residents. Then we got the ACP grant and we hired some people to do some ongoing work. And I have to say, these, uh, uh, our crews have done an incredible job. And basically, the invasive species has been, I think we've held it to the western half of the lake and uh, the eastern half is relatively clear. But we will be interested to see what happens this spring. Thank you. All right, thank you, Bernie. Um, does anyone have any questions for Bernie? Uh, no questions yet in the chat box, but while they're uh, pouring in, I do, I do have a question there for you, Bernie. I was just curious if, um, if you know of any other lakes in Alberta that have um, that are struggling with uh, flowering rush at the moment, and if they've had any success or any success in other jurisdictions of uh, of, of eliminating the flowering rush in their lakes. Oh, you might be on mute, <laughs> or we might not. We might not know. Maybe. Um, Oh yeah, maybe Nicole has the uh, has a has something to add to that. Um, yeah, so there are multiple locations. Um, Lake Isle is by far the worst in Alberta, um, and then outside of that, it's basically the South Saskatchewan um, downstream from Calgary, 
all the way to uh, the South Saskatchewan, like the Bow River and the South Saskatchewan are the next locations. Uh, we haven't had any real good success because um, we've been chipping away at the population with an, an unsuperior herbicide uh, until recently. So Innisfail has been trying to address their population of fire and rush for about six years. Um, and basically just using a herbicide that cut off the tops and then it was allowed to regrow from the roots. Um, they have switched to the same herbicide we applied last year at Lake Isle, which actually goes down into the plant and kills the root system so it can't regrow. And so we're, we're hoping that we'll see a much better improved response um, from our efforts in the next couple of years because of that shift in herbicides. But yeah, we're, we're chipping away basically herbicides and hand pulling seems to be the biggest uh, response options for flowering rush. Amazing and amazing that you guys have been able to uh, keep the eastern end free while while it's been uh, kind of taken over the west end there. So great job. Uh, we do have another question here in the chat, which says, um, not to point fingers, but uh, do you know how uh, flowering rush was introduced at the lake in the first place? It looks like you are on mute there, Bernie. Bernie, do you want to take this one? You're on mute as a resident opinion. Yeah. No, uh, well, it's greenhouses, basically. It was sold as an ornamental plant. Yeah, so we suspect that it was probably mishandled or intentionally introduced into the lake for aesthetic reasons. They thought it was a pretty plant. Mm -hmm. um, Holes Greenhouse, we know, sold it back in the 1990s. So it could have been a, a long time introduction for sure. So, mm -hmm. and they don't currently sell it. No, we, yeah, we, we've had reports of people trying to sell it. Um, so I think we caught Canadian Tire selling it in, I want to say 2018. Um, and we quickly got after them to rip it off the shelves because we have mm -hmm. that a power. Great. And it looks like we've got a, a hand up here um, by uh, Michelle. Um, do you want to unmute yourself and ask your question? Or maybe it's the next sure, thank hand you. Yeah. yeah, no, great. Um, and I think that there was another person, uh, Schmidt, it looks like, had their hand up as well. I'm not sure if you've seen that. But um, no, thank you, um, Bernie. That's uh, great work. And uh, congratulations on that. That's, uh, that's pretty spectacular. Um, way to go and keep on going and thank you for the presentation both of you but I did have a question um, for the flowering rush and it, we were mentioning something about using herbicides. Uh, oh Michelle uh, you're you're uh, moving a, a little too far from your microphone so we can't hear the question at the moment. Okay sorry can you hear me better now? Yes. Sorry about that. You were talking about a, an herbicide that you're using for the flowering rush and that it, it's going to be um, applied um, more rigorously this year, correct? Um, what is the impact on the water in with that with that herbicide? I mean, if we're talking about algae growth and, and such, are we, I mean, adding to the problem at at a specific level, or is it just the lesser of two evils, or what is the case? So there's there's fairly minimal impacts to drinking water, swimming, you know, fishing, hunting species. So there, the herbicide has been proven to be safe and we used it in such a way that we only applied it on the flowering rush that was emergent and we have pretty precise application efforts. Um, so through that, we think that there's very little off targets to the, to the herbicide. And has there been studies done previously to see if there's an accumulation of that um, impact and such? Because there is still, of course, you know, a, a dominant um, presence of, of flowering rush in the waters. So you're yes. going to be applying that annually, so to speak. Yeah, so we're, we're looking to chip away. Hopefully we can start diminishing the amount of herbicide we'll be using. Um, so a significant portion was used last year in that heavily infested areas. We're actually looking to probably do about the same or less, um, actually taking on the entire lake this year because we'll just be touching up what was done previously last year, as well as expanding to those other more isolated populations across the eastern uh, side of the lake as well. So 
And what was that herbicide called again? So the new one that we've switched to is called Habitat Aqua and its um, active ingredient is a Mazapir. Okay, thank you. Yeah. All right, it looks like we're starting to run out of time here. So um, I think we should probably do our draw for the uh, watershed gift basket. Um, and I've been informed that our winner today is Connie Rogan. So congratulations, Connie. Uh, if you could stick around so that we can get your contact information so we can mail it to you, um, that would be wonderful. Uh, so yeah, that, that's it for our spring uh, spirit series of Watershed Wednesday. Uh, so stay tuned for our next series in the fall. And thank you all for joining us today. Uh, for more information, you can go to our website, nswa.ab.ca. And once again, you can check out our YouTube channel as well um, to view the past uh, series as well as this one. So thank you so much, everyone.